Good morning, ladies and gentlemen, and a very, very warm welcome once again. The first presentation is by an expert whom we have briefly heard during the inaugural session, Dr. E. Murat Tudzu. Thank you very much. Morning again. And then uh, we're going to start off this uh, wonderful meeting with, uh, uh, okay, with uh, uh, talking about primary prevention, uh, even the definition of the concept, definition of the word of primary prevention is open to some uh, discussion. Now I'm going to give you some statistics that are very current. This is 2016 global statistics from a, an entity called Global Disease Burden, uh, uh, Global Burden of Disease that's run from uh, 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 University of Washington in Seattle, which uh, uh, really is doing a remarkable job. As you see here, ischemic heart disease, that means that heart disease due to inadequate blood supply to, to, to the heart and stroke are the two leading causes by far, by far. So cardiovascular disease is by far the leading cause of death in, in the world. What about in India? What about the statistics in India? Again, based on global uh, burden of disease that's just published in Lancet about two months ago. What causes the most of the deaths in India? And what has changed over the last 10 years? Look at that. 2007 to 2017, ischemic heart disease was number one and number one again. Surpasses almost everything else. Stroke rose from number six to number three. So it is clear that the, the global problem is the problem of India. Let's look at the death and disability. What happened over 2000, between 2007 and 2017 in a decade? What happened when many diseases, many communicable diseases are getting better and better, less and less, and look at what happens to ischemic heart disease and all other chronic, chronic diseases, they increase. Death and disability due to ischemic heart disease and other entities increased over the last decade despite all the efforts, all the treatments. What about the premature death? That means dying in young age. When I say young age, it's not only 10s and 20s, but also 30s and 40s. Yes, neonatal disease is important, but ischemic heart disease 10 years ago was number four, now it's number two. So I think I have shown you that, that ischemic heart disease is, is a big problem in India as well. What is ischemic heart disease? I know that you come from different uh, walks of life in, in healthcare, so I'm going to, uh, to uh, uh, not address a group of cardiologists, but rather address of fellow health, health uh, care workers and caregivers. This is a disease resulting, is there a pointer here? Is this one? Okay, good. Okay, so the, what we have here is a severe obstruction in this blood vessel supplying the heart, and here is the area that is affected. And it is because of what is happening in this blood vessel that is opened up. Over many decades, this process happens, resulting in a heart attack right here when the whole blood uh, uh, flow area is, is obstructed completely. But the problem is, this problem does not start here. It starts decades before, right over here, when, this, when, the, when the blood vessel starts to get hardening or atherosclerosis. There is no such thing as a sudden heart attack. They say that it happens suddenly, but it doesn't happen suddenly. It requires years of preparation. So when the heart attack, that is a myocardial infarction occurs, there has been an increasing risk over many years, many decades. Now, when we start our efforts of prevention, tell people to lose weight, eat healthy, don't smoke, exercise, and then give them medications, cholesterol-lowering medications and all that, that happens l after the fact. That is called secondary prevention. So that we, our hope is to decrease the risk 
in some patients, maybe to keep the risk without increasing others, and then in, in, in good portion, we fail to do that, and their risk continue to increase and create problems. Now, if we can catch people with their risk, elevated risk, and then so that we prevent the event, prevent the heart attack, prevent the stroke, so that we can get more people reducing risk and maybe not sustain a heart attack. That is called primary prevention. Now we have several risk factors that is well established in 1960s. Advancing age, cholesterol abnormalities, diabetes, of I'm sorry. Here we go. I go from here, but it's easier. Okay. Um, and then uh, diabetes, hypertension, cigarette smoking, and family history. Now let's look at India. What is happening in India? This is again uh, statistics very recent from Global B Burden of Disease. Both in males and females, Indians are lo living much longer than they used to compared to 1990, when the uh, mean age was 57 to 60. It's now 67 to 70. So uh, almost a decade advancement in uh, close to two, two decades time. So that means that our risk of having heart disease increased because the most important risk factor is uh, age. Smoking is another important risk factor and it's, it's quite prevalent uh, in, uh, in India. Not only smoking cigarettes or tobacco, but also smoking fumes, as we see now and hear about it all over the world from the news and then the newspapers and the TVs that the air pollution. That's also kind of a smoke. I just wanted to bring this to your attention, this study, which, by the way, for the first time, described that smoking kills. Everybody had some intuition physicians, but this is the first study which British government um, commissioned in 1948, shortly after the Second World War. They uh, went to the general practitioners, examined them, and started to follow them. Why general practitioners? Because they knew, the US government and the researchers knew where the uh, general practitioners, and they can easily follow them, track them. They tracked them for, for, for decades. They still are tracking them. And what they established is if you smoke enough, you will, you will shave 10 years of life, 10 years of life from your survival. You, I'm not even talking about the misery and the diseases that you will have. It's just absolute reduction of life of 10 years. So there is no doubt that if we don't take care of the smoking business, we will be, will be, ever be uh, successful in this fight. The other risk factor, that is the uh, LDL cholesterol. And here I wanted to put this in to show you that there is really doesn't seem to be an absolute floor in uh, below which that the, the risk reduction doesn't happen. This is, uh, I think, that from the Shanghai study, which shows that the lower the LDL, lower the risk of the individual, uh, an individual that never had a heart attack. Of course, these risk factors compound each other. What compound means is if somebody has a, has a uh, high cholesterol, like here, also has hypertension, their risk is compounded. And if you add smoking on this, if you add obesity on this, it even compounds more. And look around next time when you're on the street, you will see people that has, um, have uh, uh, more than one, two, or three risk factors. Okay. This is a, a case study that actually I did not prepare this for, for this audience, this, this, uh, this South Asian man uh, of 45 years of age I was presenting in, in, in another venue. He has no known cardiovascular disease, no history of heart attack, no history of, of any uh, heart or blood vessel problem. He has no symptoms, no chest pain, no shortness of breath, no palpitation, no passing out. Is he says that his brother died of a heart attack of a myocardial infarction, MI, at age 44. Sister had an MI at age 55. Father had bypass surgery at age 50. So has a strong family history. 
But he says, Doctor, I'm walking regularly and I'm quite fit. I eat well. I have no other medical illness. I don't smoke. I don't have diabetes. So <clears throat> um, we did went ahead and examined them, then did some blood tests. Blood pressure is 135 over 86. Triglycerides, uh, uh, total cholesterol is 240. LDL is 162. And then uh, triglyceride 174. So now if we go to the literature, there are a lot of risk assessment tools, risk calculators. So the, one of the ones that we use is the American College of Cardiology risk calculator. When I plug these numbers in, his age, his cholesterol level, his blood pressure, his history and all that, and his calculated 10 year risk of atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease. This, this term atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease means risk of heart attack, risk of dying from a, from a heart situation, uh, having a stroke, having one of your blood vessels going to the legs or, 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 or to your gut getting occluded. The risk is 3.7%. We consider that a low risk. It's in 10 years. Uh, it is uh, less than 1 in 20, less than 1 in 25. So this is pretty low risk. So what should I do? Our patient is low risk according to a risk calculator. What should I tell to this man who's, who's rather anxious? Should I tell him, you're fine? Your family were just unlucky? Or should I tell him, go home, enjoy life, don't get stressed out about this, uh, uh, your, 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 uh, your brother's death at age 44? or you don't need any pharmacologic treatment, just eat healthy, continue exercising regularly? Or should I investigate further? I decided to investigate further, but I thought, what can I do? I can do blood screening, I can do resting EKG, I can do stress test, I can do measure the blood pressure in the, in the arm and in the legs and to see if there are any blockages. I can do what I call calcium score. Well, resting ECG is probably not very helpful. Stress test, well, I, if he does well, I will be happy, but I don't know if I can rule out his risk for future. Um, so I thought that it is gonna be less expensive and easy to do a blood test. So as you see that there are a lot of other risk factors that we talk about, and many of these uh, include uh, different blood tests. So, I can measure other kind of proteins in the blood. I can measure the um, high sensitivity uh, CRP, which indicates the inflammation, which is a major driver of atherosclerosis. I can combine them with, they say, the ratio of total cholesterol and HDL cholesterol. So it looks like that it tells me uh, the risk quite well. I can do a calcium score. Calcium score is uh, probably two decades old, maybe, may, maybe a little bit more. What it does is it, you get a CT scan with low radiation of the chest, and you look at the heart. There is no dye, no contrast injection. You see that there is no calcium, no white. Here is a little bit of calcium, and here is larger calcium. This corresponds to the blood vessels supplying the heart. So it shows deposits of calcium, and calcium does not occur in the, in the blood vessels unless there is already starting of the atherosclerosis, starting of the hardening of the arteries, sometimes advanced. The amount of calcium corresponds to the risk. That doesn't necessarily correspond to the blockage or the severity of the blockage, but the extent tells us that there is a lot of problem going on. So that here, for example, no calcium score, you can comfortably say that your, your, the, uh, the, your, your risk is quite low. Well, this is an intermediate risk, but this is very large amount of calcium and high risk. If I combine this calcium score with other risk factors, there is clearly an incremental value in understanding in, in patients who are who I have difficulty to decide what to do, just like this 40-year-old uh, uh, Asian man. Now, let me remind you again, here is, uh, here is our patient, here is his risk, here is the blood, uh, the blood test, and here is now the additional test. 
the protein called LP little a is clearly high. High sensitivity CRP is, is, is not very high, but it's at the intermediate risk level. The calcium score, at his age, a man, 90% of the people, 89% of the people have lower calcium score than he. So that puts him at a fairly high risk. So when I looked at this, I told myself, I can't let this man go without adding anything else. He's not obese, I can't get him uh, slimmer. He's not smoking, I can't stop him, I can't, I can't tell him stop smoking. He's not diabetic, he says he's exercising and eating healthy. So I put him on uh, a statin to lower his LDL cholesterol, which was one, 162. So that is a, a primary prevention in action. Patient didn't have a heart attack, but he, he, I assessed his risk and I, I, I added uh, 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 pharmacologic treatment to it. Now that is primary prevention, okay? So in primary prevention, what I did was I caught him long before this obstruction when this hardening is occurring demonstrated by calcium score and others, and I'm gonna continue this treatment, hopefully to reduce his risk to sustain a heart attack. But the action didn't start here. The action start much earlier. So I gotta start this much, much, much earlier, this, the, uh, the, uh, the prevention. That is called primordial prevention. Before anything occurs. So that I can go and keep the risk very low. I can go all patient's life. That is called primordial uh, prevention, meaning that it will start at the baby age, neonate. No, it will start even before conception in the mother. How they, how they eat, what they eat, what is their weight, what is the environment in the house. Even if the father stops smoking after the baby is born, there's a lot of tobacco products embedded in the carpet, in the, in the upholstery. That, so you gotta think it in those terms, not only after, this, after the disease starts to occur. We know that very well that many things are behavioral. Here is data, not a new data, but still I think a valid data. In the United States, mortality due to behavioral causes are substantially how we, uh, what we eat to get obese, how uh, active or inactive we are, and how much we smoke. You take that out, just how much uh, behavioral deaths that we're gonna have, you will see. So the largest columns here are obesity and inactivity and smoking. Now, I looked at, you know, there has been a dramatic reduction in the Western world, in the industrialized world, or in the, in the high-income countries. The, uh, a dramatic reduction in deaths due to coronary artery disease, ischemic heart disease, meaning that the uh, age-adjusted death rate dropped dramatically. People get heart problems, but they don't die easily. So when we ask the question, why? We all, as an intervention cardiologist and cardiac surgeons, we said because we do great bypass surgery and we put a lot of stents. Well, I think it makes a di difference with the medications as well, but it's only minority. The majority, 50% of more, is uh, risk factor modification because we were able to get people to stop smoking, to exercise, and, then, and to eat healthier, and change their habits, hopefully, or take care of their cholesterol and blood pressure and, and, and diabetes. So this is a very, very important slide to show us where we should go. Of course, everything, not, everything is not individual. Part of it is population issues very difficult to work. Look at the statistic. This is the average per capita sugar consumption uh, over the last 150, 180 years. Look at this. And uh, we know that, I think that the sugar is clearly responsible, particularly here that we are all witness that the, the, the waste size increased because of this since 1960 in the United States and other parts of the world and continue to increase and it's the same problem in India as well. The, I got these pictures from New York Times. They are talking about traffic jam. Because I remembered this picture, couldn't find it for, I, but I spent time, went to the archives of New York Times and picked this up. In 1960s, they were talking about the, um, um, uh, the traffic jam in Shanghai and traffic jam because of bicycles. Not cars, there is no pollution. Bicycle traffic jam. 
Now, in, 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 in Beijing and in, in Shanghai, they're trying to introduce bicycles with, with very fancy setups because they have this problem. I know that many of you are not uh, unfamiliar with this problem because I, that's happening in, in, in Delhi and uh, everywhere else. Yesterday, there was an article in New York Times about the, uh, about the pollution in, in, in India. So that population level societal changes is a sine qua non must be uh, uh, prevention measures. Now, I'm going to tell you about a little, uh, not so little, but a, a, a very important study that will make the case about our behavioral change within the context of the larger change. Now, <clears throat> we know that if somebody at age 40 or 50 has cholesterol, untreated cholesterol, less than 200, untreated blood pressure, 120 over 80 or less, non-smoker, never smoked, no or moderate alcohol, no diabetes, no heart attack history, no history of heart disease, they have a very good chance to live long free of heart disease. These investigators asked the question. They said, what happens if these characteristics are present at age 20, 25? So they got 3,154 young people, 18 to 30 years old, evaluated their healthy lifestyle. They looked if they have smoked, what is their health diet, they, they graded their head diet, they graded their physical activity, they looked if they have a normal body weight, they check if they are drinking too much, and they followed them for 20 years. These are healthy people, 3,000. And what they found was, if they had all these positive values, their chances of 20 years later having this signature wonderful profile is 61%. Two out of three almost guaranteed to have a good uh, long-term outcome. 39%, it drops even with one risk factor, 30%. If, you, if you're smoking or, or obese, not eating much, not moving much, and, and drinking, your chances of, of uh, getting through life without big problem is minuscule. So I think that this tells you a lot what to do. Not very difficult, but it's a lifestyle issue. I put this, Dr. Panda is just from, uh, from Mumbai, and then uh, this guy on the right-hand side is, is in traffic. Uh, and then he's stressed out, and uh, his, his, his archery looks much different than the guy that's looking at the uh, beautiful blue sea and then uh, maybe meditating there. So I think that there's good data now. When you are stressed out, what is the stress? Stress is you, are, you have a responsibility but you don't have the authority. So you're in your car, you gotta come to Ramesh Kapadia's um, uh, uh, meeting, and then you have an important uh, appointment, but the, you are stuck in traffic. You can't fly, you have no authority, but you have a lot of responsibility. That is what stress is all about. And here, of course, the, the activated blood cells and then all the other proteins and the inflammation and so forth this creates. So I think that this is, this, and the stress spares no organ system. It's not only heart, everywhere. I, I listed here. If you want, I can give you this slide, but uh, I, this is only a, a limited list. So that's why I think that Universal Healing Center and, and, and this activity of Universal Healing Center, which is, by the way, established in memory of Dr. Kokila uh, Kapadia, is going gonna, is gonna to go after all these uh, stress and other uh, uh, needs of uh, preventing heart disease rather than treating heart disease. Thank you very much. Thank you.